and cybersecurity lessons throughout the uh, duration whilst we're all locked up of the COVID uh, outbreak. Uh, so hopefully we can utilize our uh, sort of time or being locked away. Hope you're all feeling safe um, and, and, and healthy and whatnot. Um, but let's use this time to go over some, some sort of information over OSIN. So welcome to today's lesson. Um, this is more sort of geared towards the advanced group out of the three that we're doing, uh, sort of key stage four upwards. Um, for those guys that haven't tuned in um, this week, I'm going to be instructor. I'm a, I'm a lead web app uh, consultant uh, for Sizium down in Bletchley Park, um, ex-military, and focus my efforts very much on the offensive side uh, and a red team enthusiast. Enough about me, um, and let's get on to the agenda and get your hands uh, on keyboard and hacking today. So um, pretty much no slides here whatsoever today, guys. Um, it's pretty much going to be all live practical. Um, so that we can get you um, practicing uh, on, on the actual keyboards and the techniques and things like that as well. So we're going to have a look at what OSINT is, uh, what it stands for, how we can use it, uh, why we might be interested in these techniques uh, and these tactics. We're going to leverage techniques such as Google Maps um, and how much information we can find through those, uh, both uh, physical access uh, information, technical information, um, and potential um, uh, they call it uh, patterns of life and things like that, that you'll be able to map out using Google Maps. And I'll, I'll show you and teach you how to do that shortly. We're going to have a look at DNS dumpster and uh, sort of open source intelligence in terms of uh, passive scanning. Uh, we're going to uh, DNS dumpster my company, Sizium, and see what information we can gather from them. We're going to have a look at uh, wireless technology, how we can locate access points on uh, postcodes and what information that might give away and how we can reduce our online presence and make ourselves more secure and find those vulnerabilities before the bad guys do. Um, most of us have a social media account, um, but are they secured enough? Are they locked down? Uh, lots of people have these accounts, but they don't spend the time actually secured. So remember back to the CIA triad, the confidentiality, integrity, uh, and availability, uh, and then go think about the usability, security, and functionality of those uh, components. Um, are we um, just using a service for its usability and functionality, but are we actually spending the time to secure that usability and functionality? So uh, social media, we're going to um, map out a um, someone's uh, account in terms of their patterns of life, again, using social media. Um, and we're going to show you um, how to do that using a tool called Creepy. We're going to have a look at some stuff called Exiv data, so data about data. Um, James on um, episode one, day one, uh, was talking about the use of steganography. Uh, and we're going to actually go through that example in terms of hiding text inside a music MP4 file and how we reveal that. Uh, we're going to have a look at, this is going to be tricky because I need to swap the screens and I've got three mobile phones I'm using. Uh, so uh, I'm going to try and attempt to do a live SMS spoofing. Uh, and then if we've got time, we're going to have a look at phishing, say, passwords and things like that as well. And how we can mitigate uh, against those type of attacks because we've probably at one time come into contact of some form of phishing email. How we can identify those uh, and how we can potentially, if identified, change our passwords to mitigate against these type of attacks. We're then going to have a quick overview of what we spoke about and how we mitigate against each one of these attacks to make ourselves more secure. It's finding these vulnerabilities before the bad guys do. So bear with me, um, it's going to be a lot of changing screens for me today. Um, I'm hoping not to have any technical issues. Uh, so sit back, uh, watch, uh, or join along with me if you can keep up the speed. It is going to be fairly fast paced. Um, I'm going to be working off this document today, uh, if I can find it. Where is it? Uh, and it's, this will be left in the description for you guys. So I suppose, first and foremost, uh, what is OSINT? Um, so let's have a look uh, on the internet at uh, what OSINT might be. So while I'm talking, have a read of what I've highlighted here for you. Um, the word open source refers to freely available information on the internet or sources um, that are free. So this might be the use of Google Maps, for example, um, and we're using Google Maps to build uh, information around our target that we are, uh, our target of interest. So perhaps we're on a red team engagement and we need to have a look at um, what types of CCTV that they may be using? Um, are there known vulnerabilities in that? Are they jammable, for example? Pretty high level stuff, 
Uh, or alternatively, are they, are they using Google Maps uh, where we can find out information in terms of access ways in and things like that? So just having open source freely information um, for most people when we don't know the um, answer to a question, we'll Google it because it doesn't cost us a penny and Google is pretty much the oracle. Um, and this will make sense as we go through those exercises. So now that we know what open source intelligence is uh, and, um, and what it stands for, why might we, why might, I can't talk today, it's been really, really, uh, it's been an early start and not enough coffee. Why might we use uh, open source intelligence? So we might use open source intelligence um, in order to gain technical information about a target, um, freely information about people who might work there, email accounts, uh, but where do we get this information from? So we've mentioned Google and Google Maps. That's a pretty obvious and easy one. Uh, and we mentioned in yesterday's episode about gaining information from job boards. So perhaps Sizing, for example, are recruiting for a server admin engineer or a system engineer, something like that, for example. Uh, and Sizing are silly enough to put uh, that system engineer must have um, server 2012 qualifications and must be, um, you know, must be familiar with um, some form of system such as Solaris version 123, for example. So straight away, that's pretty specific information. Um, that can automatically be an assumption that Sizing, for example, are using uh, Solaris version 1.2.3, for example. Um, so we might, if we are recruiting as businesses, we might want to not give our technologies away on job boards. It's probably a bad idea to do that. Because straight away, we're now building an attack platform and, uh, and doing our numeration on that technology in the background. LinkedIn, um, most people on LinkedIn, absolutely fantastic website. If it's secure, if your profile is secure correctly, um, it's used as a network uh, networking tool. Um, but like most people, um, most people like to talk about themselves. So they put CV numbers, uh, CVs uh, on LinkedIn with email addresses, phone numbers, uh, you name it. So, so be aware of what information that you're actually putting on LinkedIn, guys. Okay, so be careful about that. Uh, Pipple is another really good website uh, or application for you to use. And it basically trawls thousands of online databases uh, about a particular target or person. Is that person connected to X, Y, or Z social media platforms? Uh, maybe people can find um, uh, other phone numbers, email addresses, accounts. It can be a very powerful tool. There is a paid version as well. It's not that expensive. And if you're in the uh, sort of industry of open source intelligence and you want to narrow down your uh, attack footprint or online footprint, people uh, is a really good way of doing that and actually finding the information that is out there uh, on the internet. Obviously, going more in the advanced, which we're not going to touch, uh, would be like information from the dark net, not the surface web and things like that, which we're not going to go into today. This, this, this uh, lecture is not for that. Um, more on the technical sides, uh, it might help us gain a visual on the target, understanding the technologies in that, in that building or that organization, such as their physical access in terms of their turnstile gates. Maybe that turnstile gate has using a particular NFC near frequency uh, communication technology like um, access cards where we touch uh, on the, the the gate and the gate releases us to go through much like the London tube for example um, so we can have a look at what types of authorization uh, attacks that we could use like proxy marks and cloning cards if we can identify that technology uh, you could potentially use that to gain elevage uh, into other uh, places into that buildings uh, and we're going to have a look at how we do that in a second so straight away, a lot of information before we've even, you know, moved from the laptop or even touched the target in terms of uh, IP addresses. This has all been passive in nature, which means that uh, there's no trace back to me as the, the attacker, if you will. So let's have a quick look at Old Gate Tower. So um, I quite like this building. I used to walk past it uh, every day for work. Um, but I sort of every time I walk down this, this road here back to, to, to Liverpool Street, and every day I sort of, sort of say, saw the same people come out of this London tube. Um, this is a shared building, so um, lots of different companies in here. But I used to say at around about the same time, I'd see the same person come out the London tube as I was walking um, to, to my place of work. And down here, you can see that there's a coffee shop. I'll try and zoom in for you. Uh, that's not cool, man. Uh, <laughs> uh, bear with. So that wasn't meant to happen. Um, but you can see that uh, if I move back over here, 
uh, there's a uh, there's a coffee shop over here, Black Sheep Coffee Shop. And we'd see this pe person come up from here, they'd order their coffee, but people get quite lazy. They wear their access cards around their neck. So straight away, I know how the access card's made up. Maybe I can get onto Photoshop and start making a card. And then if tomorrow, when I, my proxy mark comes up, I could potentially clone cards to walk into this. Um, and if I look here, we now start understanding the technology uh, that is used in these turnstiles. So now that we need to start thinking about, is this a method of entry? Uh, or, or not. Uh, so straight away, a lot of information just about their physical assets before we've even touched that system. More on the technical side though, uh, and more for penetration testers, this is gonna be a, uh, useful information. We're gonna navigate over to a website called DNS Dumpster. Now I've used uh, my own company uh, because I have permission to do so, uh, Sizium.com. So straight away, it gives you away their online presence on, in terms of where they might be using their uh, hosts um, in terms of data centers, for example, for cloud. Uh, and it gives you some IP addresses. So straight away, we want to be noting these down uh, in Cherry Tree, OneNote, KeepNote, whatever it is that you're using. And we've got some name servers here, TXT records. Maybe they aren't using SPF records. In this case, we are. So if they was not using SPF records, we'd probably be thinking maybe we could uh, spoof emails internally, for example. Um, your cyber project for tonight is going to have a look at how DNS works. Um, it's the backbone of the internet. This lecture is not for understanding uh, or teaching you about DNS. Um, it's effectively have a look at DMARC and have a look at SPF, which is the sender policy framework. Uh, and these are all ways that we can mitigate against these types of attacks that we're talking about. So for example, if we wanted to passively scan uh, this organization's IP now, we could copy that, head over to Shodan, which is obviously a passive scanner, and be sensible with this, guys, because uh, you will get caught out of if, if you're using this irresponsibly. Um, and we've got the IP address, uh, and we've got some open ports and services, uh, both HTTP 80 and 443. We could come down here and we could start going through this information in terms of the SSL certificates when they expire, what kind of algorithms and uh, that they're using for secure negotiation like TLS and SSL and things like that. And that opens up us more to an attack surface of different types of attacks that we could potentially go after. Uh, we're not going to have a look at those uh, because it's just a short lesson today. So once we've got some technical information, maybe we want to have a look at what their wireless capability uh, and footprint looks like. Uh, well, we can do that with a website called wiggle.net. Now I'm using the Bletchley Park uh, postcode and I've kind of zoomed all the way into the center of Bletchley Park. Um, all these uh, black uh, dots on the screen here are access points, they're routers uh, for organizations or companies. But how does that help us as an attacker? Well, first and foremost, it gives us latitude and longitude, which we might want to come into uh, later. Uh, so we'd note that down as well. Um, now, what we can tell um, is this BT Hub, for example. Now, this is a default SSID. And um, for those at home who are, use, and most of you will have some form of wireless router at home, what is your SSID and how do you connect to it? Is it Tom's Wi-Fi or is it BT or Virgin Media Wi-Fi, for example? Now, the assumption that we can get by this picture is because they haven't changed the default SSID and it's stick to BT Hub, we can safely assume, and it is assumption, that the default configuration for their password, their root password for their um, uh, BT Hub is the same as well. So straight away, if we had close or near access to the BT Hub, we could potentially start thinking about potential wireless attacks in, in terms of default credentials. So uh, another part of your cyber project today uh, is to have a look at what your SSID is at home. And if it's the default one, get that changed to something, uh, something else so it doesn't give away the manufacturer, whether that be BT, Virgin Media, EE, et cetera. And the reason for this is we can easily Google what the default password was for a BT Hub uh, B5 MJC5, for example. And we'd probably get the default password. Now, if we were in close proximity to that, we could try that password and potentially log into that network, which wouldn't be a good idea. Um, so straight away, change default passwords uh, and change default SSIDs is normally a good idea as well. So moving through this quite uh, quite nicely, um, the other thing I wanted to mention was MAC addresses. Now, a MAC address, for example, um, we're not seeing any on screen, uh, but in some of your examples that you may see is you might see a bunch of uh, numbers. Now, those numbers are a MAC address, uh, and the first half of that MAC address you could Google, and it would tell you the manufacturer 
of that router uh, or access point, such as Virgin Media um, or um, uh, BT, which now opens you up to uh, more kinds of attack services for those. Uh, so be aware of that as well, guys. Now, um, most of you watching today will have some form of social media uh, account, whether that be Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, uh, Instagram, or all of them. And most of them are owned by Facebook these days, like Snapchat, Instagram, WhatsApp, it's all owned by Facebook. Uh, and there's been lots of, uh, obviously, news in the media for, for quite a while. So how can we use this? Well, there's a Python script or tool out there called Creepy, and I'll take you over to this website now. Uh, I've just downloaded the, the, the Windows version. I'm not going to take you through the setup. That can be part of your cyber project today. It's to download Go Geo Creepy and do this against your own social media uh, platform. There's lots of online guides on how to use this. But a quick overview may be this, for example. So what we've done is we've done a search against this user here. Uh, this is quite old, so it's old information. I just was done quite a long time ago. I didn't want to do live information. Now, um, effectively, what we're going to do is these are the con this is every tweet that this person has ever done. Here's the location, and I've just trawled for the Twitter platform here. Now, it gives me the latitude and the longitude of each tweet, which can now be start really, really um, uh, important. Because let's have a look at this date timestamp here, for example, quarter to twelve at night. Now, most people that are tweeting at quarter to 12 at night is probably safely assuming that that's probably going to be home address. Now, what this does, uh, and from that information, we can gather uh, quite a lot of uh, what most common latitude, longitude is of where this person's tweeting from. Now, most people spend the majority of the time at their work, um, not in our case, uh, obviously, it's at home at the moment during the COVID, uh, but on when life gets back to normal, we spend most of our time at work if we don't have a working from home role. So 26 tweets here, 10, 11, 5, and 2. So we can probably assume that this place here uh, is place of work, for example. The next location is probably place of leisure, boyfriend, girlfriend's house, gym, for example, um, or uh, pub. Uh, and number 10 is probably going to be their home address, for example. And we could probably marry that up, drag the little guy over there, and have a look at what's around and start finding out what this place is. Does that make sense? So pretty, pretty powerful stuff. Uh, so make sure that your uh, social media platforms is completely locked down in order to mitigate against these types of attacks. So uh, good stuff. Um, let's have a look at metadata and what metadata is. So I'm going to move over to uh, a parrot machine. Uh, you guys probably using Kali Linux. You downloaded that yesterday uh, or, or on Monday. Um, but we spoke about Black Arch and Parrot today. I'm, I'm going to use Parrot to show you a little bit of that. Now. All I've done is uh, I've opened uh, a web page uh, called GitHub and I've just searched for EXIF samples. So this picture I hope is going to have some EXIF data in there. I've downloaded that and then I've navigated using my CD uh, uh, downloads um, commands and that's dropped me into my downloads directory. Now if I have a look at that, I've downloaded this picture here. I know nothing about that picture. I've never seen it before. So I'm going to use the tool called EXIV uh, and bring this uh, uh, and draw the EXIV data from this JPEG. Now, um, there are ways we can mitigate against this, and we'll have a look at that in a minute. So straight away, we can now start seeing uh, the latitude, the longitude, uh, the type of um, camera that this may be taken. This was a Nikon, for example. The dates, uh, whether the flash, uh, uh, the flash fired or not, and in this case, it didn't what the lens size was, so straight away, uh, we're building quite a big uh, piece of evidence just from a picture. Uh, EXIF data or metadata uh, is data about data. Um, so straight away, we can potentially drag and drop these coordinates, I, I, I would reckon, into uh, Google. Uh, we'll come on to that one. I haven't done this yet. Let's see if we can get a location. This would be pretty cool if we can, actually. Nice and slow. Okay, so it's a little bit slow. Sorry, guys, for the technical problems. What I'm trying to do is basically grab the uh, the latitude and longitude. Uh, and see if we can match that picture up and find the location of where it was and get some form of match. So straight away, 
Um, and do follow, follow this on, uh, follow me with this as well. So we're going to cancel that. I don't know what's going on here. Uh, my VM's been a little bit slow. So let's tidy that up a bit, bring that back. Uh, coordinates should look like that. Uh, we put a comma in between and then we get the longitudes of those coordinates uh, and we paste them in as well and without hopefully with some luck I've not tested this out yet uh, we should get the location of where that picture that I just downloaded was taken so let's have a look at that and it doesn't like that one at the moment it's not an issue we'll play around with it very slow probably should have uh, tried this one beforehand uh, and it's slowly trying to get there it looks like it's potentially found somewhere has it no okay it's really really slow at the moment for some reason if we played around with the um the, the coordinates you get you get the idea uh this would show you where that picture was taken uh, but my vm is being really really slow at the moment so i'm going to come off that uh, but you get the latitude you get the longitude um and you would be able to view where that picture is um maybe i'll try off a vm in a second after that um, at the end so um so going back and getting on to to target um we've viewed data about data um, and we had a look at, uh, on episode one, James kindly uh, went through the encryption and coding module, uh, and he said this word called steganography, hiding data inside data. Uh, and effectively, what we're going to do is have a look at how we gather that information and potentially look for steganography files. So um, somewhere down here, um, I have downloaded a file called Milkshake from um, uh, Hack the Box. And if I double click that, you can hear, hopefully, oops, we can hear that it's My milkshake brings all the boys to the yard and they're like, so that's it's better than your... MP4 file. However, if we were to open this in technology such as Sonic Visualizer, for example, and play it again, My milkshake brings all the boys to the yard and they're like... We can see that it is just that MP4 file. Now, if we add a layer and we say, I want to add a spectrogram onto this, we can see that there's a hidden message inside this saying, hack the box, and here's our first string for one of the challenges called milkshake, for example. So hiding text inside um, can be quite powerful as well. So going through this quite quickly, uh, all of this is going to be in the description, so don't worry. We're going to have a look at social engineering uh, in a second. I just want to make sure that I've covered steganography, exif data, SMS spoofing. Uh, I'm going to have a look at phishing uh, as well. So if we move over to um, our Parrot machine, um, and we're going to have a look at how we uh, do that in a second. So I want to bring your attention to the set toolkit in a second. Um, EC Council iLabs have kindly uh, donated a whole bunch of lab material. They're working quite hardly to get that up for you guys. We've got a safe environment to play, uh, and that should work for you guys. So first and foremost is we're going to have a look at how to, to spoof text messages. Um, and I'm going to be using a website called Clockwork SMS. I've already signed in. I've got my access keys and things like that. This can be really tricky to get right. So hopefully on the screen, flicking through, we're not going to have any issues. Now, I've already put my AP I key in here and things like that. So I'm not going to show you the to and from phone numbers because I'm using them as well. Um, another way um, to, to do this, um, in fact, let's get, let's get straight on with it, see if I can do it. So. Um, I'm just logging into to, to mobile phone now um, and what I'll be able to do is share this screen with you and I'm just going to share the mobile phone screen if I can and I'm just going to join this on the mobile phone okie dokie so what we've got here is you can see my mobile phone now um, effectively um, I'm going to to be I've got this person called James which I'm going to be James uh, and we've got this person called Claire both James and Claire um, that we all have each other's numbers is the point now if I have a look at uh, James's text message for example um, I'm going to be playing on this phone so so this is um, this is Abby's phone, as you can see, that you've got on your screen. And this one here, uh, which ain't going to let me show you, uh, is my phone. So I'm just going to text now um, this uh, and say hello, which you should see on your screen come through. And I just text that as me. Now, what I want to try and to do uh, is effectively 
saying the same text message, but to come from Claire, but it, I'm as the attacker going to be doing this. So I've set up my API key. And as you can see on the screen, uh, you'll now start seeing uh, something come up. Uh, and I'm just gonna flick you back over to that screen. And as you can see, I've just sent a message through my browser, uh, through the API Clockwork SMS to Claire, um, uh, sorry, to Abby, Abby's phone from Claire saying, hi, this is, hi Abby, this is Claire. It's not Claire, it's me as the attacker. Uh, so have a look at Clockwork SMS uh, and we'll be able to show you that. So if I just confirm that I'll send from the same text message um, from my phone, James, I'll just open my own phone. So this message here, so that should come from James, and it does, fantastic. But I go back over to my browser uh, and I uh, send that file. As you can see, um, in the it comes from Claire, not, uh, not James, and I've just sent it from James in the browser. So I've spoofed Claire's number, um, making it look like it's from Claire, uh, but it's not, it's from me as the attacker. So if I open this now, uh, as you can see, I sent this this message saying I need to see you at lunch, uh, but it's it looks like it's come from Claire. It's, it puts it in the same field, uh, but it's not. It's me as the attacker. So I've used three mobile phones to achieve this today. So we're just going to swap over. And the final exercise for today, I'm going to attempt to uh, show you how to um, uh, how to. You can see my screen. Yes, you can. I'm going to show you how to um, set toolkit. Uh, we're going to copy a website. We're going to use uh, we're going to use uh, Twitter in this example. I'm going to run this as sudo because I'm in Parrot. Uh, type in set toolkit, and I can't type today. Sorry, that that demo kind of threw me a little bit. It was uh, really hard to flick through screens and to get on the mobile phone. So the first thing I'm going to do is load the social engineering toolkit up. Uh, I'm going to click social engineering attacks. Um, let's do websites number two, credential harvesting number three. For the argument's sake, I'm just going to make it um, do a, a template. Um, so my IP address, I want to copy Twitter, for example, and that starts hosting that on there. So if I now play the role as um, as victim, for example. I flick over to, to a browser. I would send them the, the address of, uh, I'm hosting on my local machine. So my IP is 192.168.83.135. So if I go to that address, 192.168.83.30, was it 135? I think it was 135. Yeah, it was. So this looks like Twitter. It is an old version because I can't be bothered to set up anything nice up. Uh, but effectively, uh, I'm not on Twitter. I'm on my own address. Uh, but what I could do is go to bit.ly uh, or um, tiny URL to change 192.168.83 to some random, uh, some random string. And I could send that in a text message using spoofing, for example. Uh, and they would come to this page and they would think it's Twitter. So I'm going to log in uh, as some user, for example. And hopefully you can see this on my screen. I'm just going to try and make that a little bit bigger. Uh, some user, and I'm going to put super secret password. So what that does, I'm not going to save it. Um, it doesn't do anything. It just renegotiates me to uh, the Twitter page. However, and it is slow for some reason today, um, that wouldn't have logged me in. But if I go back over, we can see that I've used the credentials of some user and super secret password because I've hosted it on a phishing link, uh, not an actual Twitter link, if that makes sense. So, so hopefully that makes sense to you guys. So we've, we've, we've managed to spoof a message. We've managed to uh, make a phishing campaign in terms of create a fake Twitter page. And we've managed to uh, harvest some credentials of a username and a super secret password. So um, going over on how all of that looks, um, if I just bring your attention over to this final slide, um, you had James, the attacker, was me. Uh, we had Claire. Uh, the attacker was able to do some OSINT, uh, find uh, Claire's number, and we knew through our open source intelligence that Abby has Claire's number. So I, uh, I used Claire's number, and I spoofed it to Abby, uh, so a message looked like it was coming from Claire, but in actual fact, it was coming from me as the attacker to Abby, looking like it was coming from Claire. Now, the reason this works is because there's a massive 
floor, let's say, in the GSM cell towers. The only way to fix this is to recall uh, SIM cards, which obviously they're not going to do. There's billions out there. Um, so it's to mitigate against these type of phishing attacks and false SMS spoofs and things like that. Um, make sure that you're using some form of encryption, VPNs, uh, WhatsApp, um, encrypted channels in order to to not use um, SMSs. Um, it's encrypted channels. So I hope all of that makes sense to you guys. Um, the link will be in the description. Um, I hope you enjoyed this session. Any questions whatsoever, uh, give uh, Jonathan uh, a text at uh, Cyberschool. Uh, stay safe, guys. I hope you're enjoying these. Um, and you guys are awesome, as usual. Thank you.